Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Between the Pillars, the Fisher's video podcast series where you get to meet uh, get to meet our staff, get to meet our collections. Uh, my name is John Shoesmith. I'm the outreach librarian here at the Fisher, and I'm going to introduce my colleague, uh, Sean Algarvio, very shortly. Just wanted to give you a little update on what's happening here at the Fisher. It is, today is Friday, uh, November 12th, and we're actually going to be reopening to researchers next week. Um, we don't have our... Um, we don't have our, our replacement door yet, but what we have is a temporary door where we can allow researchers in um, to work in the reading room. So we're not open to the public yet, just to researchers. That's gonna be done um, by, by, by an appointment. And you can do look all, all that information up on our website. Um, you can book a time, uh, book your materials, and we're very looking forward to having people, to having researchers back in the library again. It's been uh, it's been almost a year, over a year, I think, since we've had uh, people in the library. So, um, so please visit the website for all that information, and we hope um, you come and visit us and use our materials again. Now I want to, we're going to look at some of some really special materials today um, with my uh, my colleague Shauna Algarvio. Shauna is a um, one of our talent students here at Fisher. She's actually in her second year um, of, of of being an intern at Fisher, and unfortunately, um, her first year was done um, exclusively remotely due to our closure here at uh, at Fisher. So, Shauna, I'm curious. Well, first of all, welcome, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, we're going to be talking about papyrus today, but before we um, introduce the materials. I want to introduce you a little bit and talk a little bit about um, your experience, first of all, at Fisher. I mean, obviously, now that you're here working within the building, it must be such a different experience than, um, than, your, first, uh, than, than your first year at, uh, in, in the talent program. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, of course. So it, it is quite different. Um, I love that I'm finally able to actually be in the library and handle the materials um, personally with my own hands. Um, what I did mostly last year because of everything being remote, I worked on um, a lot of donation lists, um, gift lists, so acquisitions, um, determining you know what the library had and what it um, needed. Um, but I also got the chance to work on a lot of special projects, which was really fun. Um, I worked on printers devices um, and the various types that we have at the Fisher um, and also kind of going into the iconography and the people behind the printers devices. Um, I also worked on um, the Library of Congress subject heading changes mm -hmm. um, for indigenous materials to make it more culturally appropriate. Um, and that was a great learning experience, understanding um, what are the culturally appropriate terms to be used when discussing indigenous uh, materials, um, as well as seeing the differences between how, you know, um, colonial colonialist settlers would um, term something that's indigenous compared to what is the correct term. Um, so that was a great learning experience. You, you've also um, done a bit of grunt work for us because she's, Shauna has been a participant in uh, Between the Pillars backstage. Uh, she's done a lot of the captioning. Uh, she pretty much done the, all the captioning for uh, editing all the captioning for, for all the podcasts. And that was really fun as well because I got to see every video very in-depthly. So, and this is, this is great for me too because I was, I was telling Shauna the other day that this is only the second time we've been in the building together so it's kind of yeah. it's kind of nice for all of us to to meet some of the staff that we've uh, that we hired last year that we've never been fortunate to uh, to work with so um so so it's great so let's let's talk a little bit about what you're going to be showing papyrus and maybe you can kind of give us actually a bit of background into your own what you bring to this topic i mean whether sure. it's an undergrad studies or a personal interest so um, I did my HBA here at U of T. Um, I graduated back in 2019 and I majored in um, near Middle Eastern civilizations uh, where I focused on um, the ancient streams. So Egypt, Mesopotamia, Persia. Um, and then I pursued a master's in that department, um, spoke specifically focusing in Egyptology um, and the cross uh, cultural relation interactions in the ancient Mediterranean ancient Mediterranean world um, with Egypt as the focus and determining um, how Egypt's culture spread across the ancient Mediterranean via iconography, um, because a lot of ancient cultures adopted Egyptian symbols and motifs um, for their own purposes to express their own ideas of kingship and religion. Um, so I, it wasn't just Egypt that I focused on. I went into the Levant. I went into Mesopotamia. I went into ancient Persia. 
Um, and then, um, as you mentioned, so I'm currently in the, mass, the Faculty of Information doing a Master's of Information um, in Library Science. And I'm also in the Book, book History and Print Culture program um, with Massey College. And what I'm focusing on now is trying to bring in my knowledge of ancient Egypt into uh, the realm of book history and the book um, because they seem to be mutually exclusive disciplines mm -hmm. when you know Egypt every culture has a book culture um, so every everything should be included um, and so what I focus on um, I like to talk about stone as a book medium um, but because of my background with ancient Egypt I was so fascinated with the papyrus collections here at the Fisher because I was actually never told um, either in my undergrad or in my graduate degree um, that the Fisher had papyri collections just 500 meters from the near Middle Eastern civilizations department. Um, and so that's what really sparked my interest to get into the field of book history within ancient Egyptian culture. Um, and because I focused on iconography in my MA, the papyri collection has a lot of Egyptian iconography because part of it is, um, cartoonage, right. um, which was used uh, to cover um, the mummy. So I was able to kind of tie in all my knowledge of ancient Egypt and my background into this field of book history and of even library science. Um, so I'm, it's a privilege to be working with this collection because never would I think that I'd be able to handle materials that are already, you know, more than 2000 years old. That seems like such a failing on our part that you weren't familiar with the collection. But <laughs> this this will be great actually because this will maybe introduce people um, to that collection. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about then the collection that's here at the Fisher, how it came here, um, what it comprises of as well. Yeah. So um, over let's say about a century, um, the University of Toronto Libraries has slowly acquired papyrus. So it first started in uh, 1901. Um, the Egyptian Exploration Fund, which is now called the Egyptian Exploration um, Society, uh, donated four papyri fragments to the University of Toronto Libraries. Mm -hmm. um, and then between 1904 and 1906, um, Victoria College Library acquired um, 36 papyri fragments from um, the Egyptian Exploration Society um, due to a subscription. So how it worked was if you subscribe to the EES, um, depending on how much you donated to them would determine how much you would receive back in value of papyri fragments. Mm, okay. um, and so I believe it was the principal at the time um, at Victoria College and a graduate student um, who acquired those papyri um, for Victoria College Library. And then in 1966, um, a professor in the classics, classics department, um, Alan E. Samuel, he brought um, various papyri collections of his own. Um, so there's three inventories. One is called um, the pa paper towel inventory um, because the fragments were wrapped in paper towels. Um, and he acquired those um, in Egypt um, uh, through some antiquity, antiquities dealers. Um, the second inventory uh, is the Oxford University Gazette um, papyri um, inventory um, because it was the fragments are um, preserved in the Oxford Gazette newspaper because it's um, a low acid um, paper. So it was kind of their version of preserving the fragments without causing much damage. Hmm. Um, and that those fragments actually came from um, the British uh, Library. And then the last inventory is called um, the Rostov Sev Wells inventory, um, which again comes from the British Library. And uh, funny enough, it's named after uh, professors at Yale University where um, Dr. Samuel previously worked, um, but no one really knows why um, he decided to name the inventory after those two uh, professors because they didn't really have, um, they are um, esteemed pap papyologists, um, mm -hmm. but they don't really have any direct relation with the collection itself. Um, okay. So maybe it's just a form of patronage. All right. Um, and then, so the Victoria College uh, Library, they um, put the, they deposited the, their papyri at the Fisher um, on long-term loan uh, right. in 1977. 
And the classics department, they deposited um, their collection at the Fisher in 2004, again, on long-term loan. Um, so the only ones that are officially donated um, to the Fisher are the original four fragments from 1901. Interesting. Well, so what, now that you've wet our appetite, um, let's let's take a look at, the, at some of the materials you you have shown us. And yes. and really, I'm, I'm, I think what we should first talk about is uh, what papyrus is and how it's created. So maybe you can bring us through that. Okay. Um, so papyrus is a member of the sedge family, um, and it's an integral feature of ancient of the ancient Nilotic landscape. Um, so it was essential to Egyptians, both in the practical and symbolic realms. Um, and it, how it works is it needs shallow water um, to grow or um, saturated water um, from the earth to grow. Um, and where it occurred was in dense thickets found along the marshes in the Nile Delta, um, and also in the low lying areas fringing in the Nile Valley. Um, so it's very much um, a part of the Nile landscape rather than the Mediterranean landscape. Um, and it was used to manufacture a variety of objects. So you find it, you know, in boats, in baskets, in mats. Um, but the most important use for it was as a writing surface. Um, so it's kind of the ancient Egyptian version of uh, paper. Right. Um, and how it was created is it um, strips of the, the pith of the plant um, inside the stalk were um, kind of pulled away from the plant and it was laid down in alternating horizontal and vertical layers and then it was dried under pressure in the sun by using rocks. So if I zoom in, you can kind of see the alternating layers. Mm -hmm. so here you have horizontal um, fibers, uh, but then you also have vertical fibers um, over here. Uh, so it was usually just um, strips laid horizontally and then vertically. And because the plant actually had kind of um, a natural adhesive, maybe like um, a sap, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, you, you didn't need to do anything um, to hold all the fibers together because the natural sap held everything together. Um, so once it was dried, it was then uh, ready to use. Um, and it was formed into rolls um, or it could, there are examples of it being cut um, to be used for codices, but because it's such, um, to fold it is makes it too fragile because of, following the grain, um, to use a book historical term, um, it would snap the, the papyrus, so it would always be rolled. Um, and then thanks to the preservation qualities afforded by the dry climate um, of Egypt's desert, many papyri have been recovered from the Egyptian sands. Whereas um, if you think about in, uh, Europe and ancient Greece and Rome, because of the wet, uh, humid climate in uh, Greece and Rome, there's actually almost no fragments that survive from the classical world in Europe just because um, the environment wouldn't allow for the preservation of uh, the fragments because you needed a dry uh, climate in order for the papyri uh, to sustain itself. So it is very much an ephemeral um, material depending on the environment that it uh, is living in. Maybe we could talk about our own means of preserving this material. Obviously, as people can see, this it's in a glass. Yeah. So um, a lot of the all the fragments in the Victoria College um, Papyrus collection are preserved in glass, um, and then in the Oxford University Gazette, obviously they're still preserved in um, the Oxford uh, Gazette uh, newspapers, um, just because. Um, the newspaper actually has some notes explaining, you know, where the fragments would have been um, in relation to the mummy. Right. Um, so it just made more sense to keep it all together. Um, some of the the Rostov was Wells inventory, so the RW inventory is in glass, and some of it is in acid-free paper. And again, with the paper towel inventory, some of it is preserved in glass, and other is in acid-free paper folders. So, so now that we've seen the material, and obviously, you know, it's it's a pretty complex uh, 
process in terms of creating. Maybe we could talk about some of the scripts then that are used on uh, on the materials. Yes. So the main um, script obviously was Greek, ironically, even though all of this is found in Egypt. Right. Um, because of uh, because all of these dates one period. Um, so this fragment, um, so as you can see, it's uh, the Greek uh, alphabet. Um, and this actually is um, a fragment of Homer's Iliad. Oh, um, so wow. it's from uh, book 23. Um, and it talks about, um, so in this chapter, um, it's after Achilles' uh, close companion Patroclus has died. And so Achilles is holding um, kind of funeral competitions in honor of his deceased friend. Um, and in this fragment, it talks about um, the foot race between Odysseus, um, little Ajax and Antiochus. Um, and Odysseus wins um, because Athena helps him um, uh, due to divine intervention, which so characteristically um, characterizes the Iliad with right. the divine intervention. And then there is another famous literary text. This is a very, very small fragment. Um, let's see where it is. Okay. Let me see if I can zoom it in a bit more. This is a very small fragment of the Thetis histories of the Peloponnesian War. Right. Um, and it's the end of chapter 73 and the beginning of chapter 74. And what it talks about is um, the Athenians are in a council with um, the I think it's the the Lacedaemonians um, and what they're they're talking about is the Athenians are retelling the story of the Greco-Persian Wars that happened 20 years earlier and they're recounting you know the great deeds that the Athenians did to save Hellas so Greece from the Persians and then they talk about um, Themistocles and all his great contributions and the reason they're talking about this is to kind of counter argue um, the complaints of the Peloponnesians um, in terms of the Athenians inflicting injustices upon them um, which is the reason for the Peloponnesian war. Um, so this it's it's really amazing how these um, these really important uh, classical works um, the Fisher actually has um, their fragments, and even though they're small, right. um, still so important in mm. terms of classical literature. So those are um, examples of Greek script or the Greek alphabet. Um, and then I will going to the classics department papyrus uh, collection. So it's not only Greek um, that they have, um, they also have a variety of other scripts, um, which makes it really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So this is Demotic. Um, this is an ancient Egyptian script. And it's actually um, a very um, stylized cursive hieroglyphs. Right. So it derives from hieratic, which is cursive hieroglyphs. Um, and this is an even simplified version of hieratic, so of the cursive hieroglyphs. Um, and this started into the third intermediate period of ancient Egyptian history. So that would have been um, uh, around 1100 BCE. Um, and this one is an account. Unfortunately, we don't know more than that just because um, textual analysis hasn't been really done on these fragments. Mm -hmm. um, and I myself have knowledge of hieroglyphs, not of demotic. Right. Um, but it's really amazing to see the diversity of the scripts that are present um, in the classics, de classics department collection uh, specifically. The other script um, that is present is Coptic. Mm -hmm. um, so Coptic is the last phase of ancient Egyptian of ancient Egyptian language. 
Um, and it's actually one of the most fascinating for me that I find because it's Egyptian language written in the Greek alphabet. Right. But the way that you can tell that it's Coptic and not Greek is because there are six um, purely Egyptian letters that were created in the right. script. Um, and so you can tell that this fragment is Coptic because this letter right here, um, mm -hmm. this, is, this is called Genja. And you see it again over here. Um, it's another genja. So this would not be found in the Greek alphabet. It's purely an Egyptian um, letter. And so there was uh, six in total. There was one that was like an um, omega, but it had kind of a descender, then which is called the shy. Then there was the phi, which is kind of like a Y. Right. Um, there's hore, which is an S. Um, there's kimia, which is a six. And then there's... Uh, Thai, which is a cross. Right. Um, and this, there were actually many dialects of Coptic um, in Egypt. Um, and even with the Arab conquests, um, Coptic was still used um, until the Arab conquest was around 642, and Coptic was still used until 1000 um, B, uh, hmm. CE. Right. Um, this would have been uh, Saidic Coptic, um, right. which is the classical dialect, as opposed to Bohiric Coptic, which is what's used in the Coptic liturgy today. Okay. And the last script um, that is evident in the Classics Department collection is Arabic. Right. Okay. If anyone would love to come and translate this fragment, <laughs> I would love to know what it talks about, um, because this in itself is a, a, a gem. Right. Um, it's very rare. I mean, there are still many um, papyri fragments that have Arabic, right. um, but it is very rare in and of itself, um, because papyrus was um, adopted by the Arabs um, when they conquered Egypt, but it only lasted for maybe 300 years because then paper started to travel in from the Silk Roads. Mm -hmm. um, but so to have a fragment written in Arabic is just wonderful. And I would love to know <laughs> what it means. So if anyone would like to come in and translate it, I would be exceedingly grateful. Yes, to all our Arabic uh, watchers out there. Yes. Um, and another, Go ahead, sorry. Um, just another thing about it, um, which is interesting um, because ancient Egyptian, just like Arabic, is written from right to left. Right. Whereas Greek is obviously left to right. So it's interesting to see um, how the ink um, kind of uh, adheres to the papyrus when you're changing um, the, the writing style. Um, so that's an interesting aspect I like to look in terms of the materiality and the bibliography, the, uh, the materiality of the fragment. So, so we've looked at some of these pieces. Now you introduced us to a term earlier in our introduction, uh, cartonage. Um, yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit how, talk a little bit about cartonage and also let's see some examples of, uh, from the collections. So I will get an example. So as previously mentioned, all the um, fragments that I showed, um, the Greek ones were from the Victoria College Papyrus Collection and then the Demotic, Arabic and Coptic, that was from Classics um, Department Collection. All of the cartoonage that we have is from the Classics Department Collection, um, although there is one example in the Victoria College um, Collection, which is fascinating. So this is what I had mentioned before. So mm -hmm. this is the Oxford uh, Gazette, Oxford University Gazette um, newspaper. So cartoonage, um, it's a composite material. It's made out of layers of papyrus or it could be made using papyrus and linen. Right. And it's a bit blurry, but the reason I love this fragment is because this part here, this is linen on oh, top of darker right. material. That's linen. And mm -hmm. then this is papyrus. Right. Um, and I, I had no idea that the collection had examples of um, linen used in conjunction with papyrus because um, 
it, it was never um, made note of. Mm -hmm. um, so to find this is really fascinating because then you also get to see um, if you know that it's high quality linen just because of looking at um, the th thread count. I know it's a bit difficult to see in the camera, right. uh, but this is high quality linen that's being used in conjunction uh, with papyrus. Um, so cartoonage, so you're combining layers of just papyrus or layers of papyrus and linen along with plaster or what some people like to call um, gesso. And so you can see these white things. Uh, mm -hmm. This is plaster. And I will show you a better example of how it looks. So again, you can see everything is placed into acid-free folders, um, but we still preserve um, the original uh, newspaper. Right. So this is a great example of how fragmented um, these materials are. Um, so again, this one, you actually see complete pieces of linen just on its own. Wow. And then again, uh, papyrus on top with the linen below. Um, and so plaster would be applied, um, kind of hold everything together, not just in terms of the materials, but the pigment mm -hmm. um, onto the papyrus. Um, so this is a lot of black pigment that's used here. Um, and if you pick up some of the pieces, that's you can kind of see that there are quite a few layers of right. papyrus in and of itself. Um, so there are fragments that are super thick um, and some that are much thinner. And you know, that in itself is a marker of status because depending on how much you've paid determined on the quality of your cartoonage. Right. Um, so this is um, an interesting way to understand um, social markers and um, the economy of ancient Egypt again. Maybe you could explain, you could explain to me what, what these are used for ultimately. Yes, so um, cartoonage, what it was used for is it was um, a material and technique used originally to create funerary masks mm -hmm. um, for the mummy, which began back in about um, 2180 BCE. Um, but over time, it then shift to creating the actual coffin of the mummy. Um, and then when you reach the Ptolemaic period, which is um, Greek, uh, Greek Egypt, it was uh, used in individual pieces that were created to cover the face, um, the chest, the torso, right. the legs, um, and even the feet of the mummies. Uh, sometimes the feet was an entire boot, or sometimes it was just a piece covering the feet. Mm -hmm. um, but so they are primarily used, uh, it's a form of funerary practice that was used for most of ancient Egyptian history. Interesting. Um, and I have a great example of just what um, gesso would look like on its own and how it is applied. So here we see that the pigment has completely come off right. um, of uh, this cartoonage piece, but you still notice the plaster um, in itself and you notice uh, the papyrus below it. So it's not, it wasn't, there are some times where the plaster is much thicker, mm -hmm. um, but this clearly was just a thin amount that was placed on top in order to hold the pigment. Um, but I wonder how well the pigment was mm -hmm. actually kept because there's right. nothing left. Right. Um, but an interesting thing that this shows is you can see text below it. Mm -hmm. So in the Ptolemaic period, um, which was 305 um, uh, BCE, they decided to start reusing um, administrative papyri that they didn't feel was necessary to keep anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so the texts were reused, but there really isn't any 
um, importance of the text in relation to the cartoonage. It was just if whatever scraps they could find um, in order to create the cartoonage, because at that point, um, papyrus was starting to become a scarcity just because of how much the Egyptians used it for basically so many materials um, in ancient Egyptian society. And they exported a lot to um, Lebanon, uh, the port city called Byblos, um, which actually informed uh, the Greek term for book and for Bible, uh, Biblion, which derives from Byblos because that is a city where they acquired the material for their writing. Um, so that was a fun fact uh, to learn about. But yes, yeah, so it was only during the Ptolemaic period where they began to reuse um, administrative fragments um, for cartoonage, which explains why so much of the text evident in the um, classics department papyrus is either legal matters, um, wills, marriage contracts, because they were just um, waste, waste of papyrus that were just used for another purpose. We, we see that through the history of book history when uh, we look at uh, waste paper used in bindings, for example. So this is yeah. not something that uh, this is something that's carried forward for for many, 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 many years. Yeah. Um, so what I'd like to go into now is the iconography right. of um, the classics department collection because that is something I know much more due to um, my background research, in yeah. Egyptian iconography. Um, so as I mentioned, cartoonage um, covered around six parts of the body. So you have the face, um, the chest, the torso, the legs, and the feet. Um, and a first example of the face is from the RW inventory. And it's actually a fragment of a mummy mask. Hmm. Um, and there's a lot to talk about in just this fragment alone. Um, so I actually only recently learned um, that red um, for the mummy mask was used as an outline to know where the hairline would have been put. Um, and even with the eye, you can kind of see below it um, that there is red. So again, right. another marker of the outline, you can see it on the eyebrow. Wow. Um, wow. Because what um, Egyptologists like to well, what Egyptologists infer is that in terms of the mummy mask, um, there are a lot of busts in uh, museums that don't have any um, patron attached to it. They're just random busts. And so what the Egyptologists think is that they were used to mold um, the mummy mask because in order to create the features of a face. So it wouldn't have just been straight papyrus. It would have been molded okay. with the plaster yeah. on um, to create an actual appearance of the face um, so that it would fit over the mummy properly. Okay. Um, and so what, it's very common for mummy masks to have, um, so this is the hair um, and it's very common to have blue because in Egyptian ideology, it um, was believed that the hair of the deities was made of lapis lazuli. And that is a semi-precious stone that comes from Afghanistan, which has a very, very um, dark blue color. Um, and so um, every day, the Egyptians wanted to imitate that divine affiliation by having their mummy mask with blue hair or with alternating blue and yellow. Um, because that kind of signified the first rays of the sun um, mm -hmm. at dawn or emerging from the primeval ocean. So the sun being uh, reborn, um, the sun god Ray being reborn um, into a new morning. So it, it symbolized rebirth, it symbolized divine affiliation um, and creation itself. It's amazing the pigments have, have I mean, are, are, are we pretty close to the colors then? I, I would say so because they are the the red is a very beautiful red, um, very clear red, um, and the blue itself is very clear. Um, the yellow, it might have just been I don't I don't know if it's faded or if that's just um, there were a variety of yellow pigments that were used, so it kind of depended on what um, the craftsman decided to use. But I would say that it's a very accurate depiction of what it would have what the pigment would have originally looked like. Amazing how it survived. 
Oh, I know. Um, and then another fragment attached to the mummy, the mummy mask, um, which I actually believe might be attached, might be part of this fragment, is um, here we can see, let's see if I can separate that better. So again, you see extensive amounts of blue again right. for the hair um, to represent that divine affiliation. And then again, you see a red outline um, mm. and this actually would have been an ear. Mm. So I, I can't help but wonder because of the red outline, right. if it kind of matches because the, the pigment itself um, is very similar and the red itself is very similar. So if it was part of the same fragment or not, um, that's something that uh, I like to do with this collection is kind of see what, um, see if I can recreate what the fragments would have originally looked like to get a better understanding of the cartoonage and where it would have been placed, um, as well as what Egyptian ideologies would have been like um, in the Greek period, because it is, you know, very late in ancient Egyptian history. Um, so it's really fascinating to see continuation. Um, more so than actually seeing divergences. Right. Like you're putting together the, these, um, these, these uh, jigsaw pieces. Yeah, and this blue, you know, this blue is still very vivid. The red is still very vivid. So it really is amazing um, how great sand, can, sand alone can be in preserving not just right. papyrus, but the actual pigments itself. Right. Um, it's quite remarkable. It certainly is. Um, so I'm going to go on to now what would have been placed atop the chest or the chest and or torso of the mummy. So this is a beautiful depiction wow. of a winged goddess. Um, and now it's hard to tell because there aren't really any markers. Um, it would have been either Isis um, who was, um, she had many roles, um, and it's hard to just condense it down to one, um, but she, she was, uh, she was a goddess of magic, um, she had a lot of apotropaic features, um, and, um, she, she was seen as a mother goddess because she was the mother, um, of the divine representation of kingship, so which is Horus. Mm -hmm. um, so she would have been seen as the divine mother of Egyptian kings by extension, because Egyptian kings were um, the earthly representation of the god Horus. Um, but it could also be the goddess Newt, um, who mm -hmm. is a sky goddess. Um, and she also had um, maternal associations um, because she was known to protect uh, the deceased um, as she embraced them for all eternity in her womb, which was seen as the coffin itself. Um, and so the, the purpose of the wings, placing it atop of the chest is kind of to mimic um, the goddess hugging the mummy itself mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a form of divine protection and of um, maternity into uh, the womb of the goddess. Um, but so we see we have a sun disk up here. Um, usually in earlier periods, if it was new, you would have the hieroglyphs ascribed to her, or if it was Isis, you would have the hieroglyph of um, a throne. Um, but when you get into the Ptolemaic period, everything is kind of the, the attributes of goddesses and, and gods are kind of all assimilated together into one. So it can be very difficult to determine actually which god or goddess it would have been if you don't have any um, text to go along with it. Um, but th this is a, a beautiful fragment and it's, and it's again, it's remarkable to see um, the pigments, the, the pigments um, and the detail. Right. Um, I, I just, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Um, and then another um, kind of motif or symbol that would have been placed at the top of the chest. Uh, this one is one of my favorite fragments. 
um, from the entire collection. So this is known as um, the Usek collar. And Usek is Egyptian, is the Egyptian term for broad. So mm -hmm. the broad collar, um, because the collar itself um, was quite long and quite large. Mm -hmm. um, and so what it was, it was um, used by elite, by royalty um, and the divine. Um, so it's found on people of all kinds of status. It was kind of the typical Egyptian necklace um, of ancient Egypt. And so it's always defined um, by concentric um, U-shaped designs. Right. Um, and if I zoom in, you can kind of see um, triangles. Mm -hmm. um, and they would have been um, a geometric version of a lotus. Um, so again, um, going back to the idea of uh, rebirth and creation. And some Egyptologists um, like to believe that the collar actually contains um, mythical connotations. Okay. Um, because when you place it upside down, um, it would look as if it's kind of like a mound Mm -hmm. because of the u-shape um and so it would kind of evoke the horizontal the horizontal rows um evoke the primeval mound of creation right. um with colorful rays emanating from the mound um characteristic of sunrise um and so it symbolizes creation and rebirth um and when looking it upside down because it would obviously it was um placed on the chest right when you turn it upside down, the head kind of seems like it's emerging from the collar as if it's emerging from uh, the womb of the horizon. Right. Um, so it's kind of mimicking um, the creator God emerging from the primeval mount. Um, so it's one of um, my favorite designs that I love to see because it's so characteristic when you see that there are um, uh, concentric U shapes, right. you know right away that it will be um, the Usek collar. And something that I discovered when I was um, piecing this together, because these are all separate fragments that I kind of tried to replicate, um, to replicate the original version. Right. If you see up here, it's very similar to the fragment that I just showed you. So you see that these are actually um, wings. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the image that I just showed you is nom nominally placed atop of the collar. So you would always find a winged, um, either a goddess or a winged scarab beetle, which again represents um, uh, rebirth and the emergence uh, of the morning sun. Right. Um, you would always find these winged deities atop the Usek collar. Um, and so this is one of the only examples in the collection where you can see them together even though the, the winged figure is very fragmented, I can't tell if it's a goddess or if it's um, a, a beetle or even um, a falcon. Right. But you, it's the only example where you find it in conjunction um, with the Usa collar, which for me is very fascinating. Amazing. Um, so now, uh, what else is there? So I'm going to move now to um, the legs and the feet. Um, right. What the iconography would have been placed on that section of the mummy. Are we able to date these, a uh, lot of these pieces? So there's kind of just a standard dating of um, the third century mm -hmm. uh, BC for the cartoonage. So the cartoonage fragments are just dated to the Ptolemaic uh, period um, uh, bef before Alexander's uh, conquest of Egypt. Right. Um, and then uh, the fragments from the Victoria College collection, um, they're estimated from anywhere from the third century BC to the third century CE. So some of them date into the Roman period. Um, right. Ancient Egypt. Um, but I, I would like to actually do some more precise dating because um, to just set a standard 
uh, date of the third century really isn't useful. Right. <laughs> okay, so this one, um, let me see if I can zoom in. Okay. So you see all these geometric shapes, and I'm assuming that they would have been attached to um, the mummy mask because that's the most common area you would find it because it kind of would replicate the be beating um, of the wig that right. ancient Egyptians would wear. Um, but the part that relates to the leg um, or the torso is this section right here. And these are actually hieroglyphs. Okay. Um, which is the only example in this collection of hieroglyphs. Um, and because it's so fragmented, it's a bit difficult um, to understand what it's saying. Mm -hmm. um, but you do notice that this here, um, this is a cobra mm -hmm. and this below is a reed leaf. Um, and that roughly translates to I say, um, so Jedi. Um, and usually that is the beginning of a funerary spell. Um, because hieroglyphs were, play, were um, painted on the cartoonage um, solely to invoke uh, funerary spells to help the deceased travel through the underworld to achieve the afterlife. Right. Because um, without the spells, they, they wouldn't be able to make it um, through the journey. So it was one of the most um, important features of funerary practice in terms of whether it's the coffin, um, the sarcophagus, which is a stone coffin, whether it was the cartoonage, um, or even um, boxes that were buried with the deceased, everything would have funerary spells on it to help their deceased through their journey um, and bring um, their earthly, their, their terrestrial status and their terrestrial um, objects with them into the next life. Interesting. Um, so I, I, I love that there are hieroglyphs um, mm -hmm. and these figures. So these are seated figures um, and it looks like as if this one has um, a flail. So kind of um, it's similar to like a fly swatter. Right. Um, and this one would have had uh, this one. It's it, you can see that there's like a tripartite wig. Right. Um, so the flail was um, a symbol of Egyptian kingship. Um, that related um, to um, shepherd herding. Right. Um, and I'm assuming the tripartite wig is a reflection of a divine figure um, right. because it was originally a divine symbol. Um, so it might be um, the, the funerary, the offering formula um, of Egyptian funerary spells often were related um, to the king being the one bestowing um, the offerings on behalf of, um, of the lay people. Right. Um, so the king was always the, one, the intermediary between um, the, ter the terrestrial and the, and the celestial, so between the mortals and the divine realm. Um, so it might be referring to the king um, and then the god uh, right after. Um, but again, it's really hard to make out exactly right. what it's saying because it's so fragmented. fragmented. Right. Um, and so the next fragment um, is actually one of the most important in terms of Egyptian ideology. So we can see here, you know, you have um, a fragment of a winged figure, um, but you also have, let me see if I can flip this around. You have this really interesting shape. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually one of a shape of one of the most fundamental concepts um, in Egyptian ideology. So this is um, a feather. Okay. Um, it's translated in Egyptian 
as uh, ma'at, which in English would be um, kind of cosmic harmony. And so what it was is, so the gods um, charged the king with upholding ma'at, so cosmic harmony, by defeating Isfet, um, which is chaos. Mm -hmm. And the Egyptian people strive to live a moral life based on ma'at in order to reach the afterlife. Okay. Um, because journeying through the underworld, you would be judged based on your morality. Um, and in art, um, the concept of ma'at was either rendered through the anthropomorphic goddess who was named ma'at um, or by an ostrich feather, which symbolized truth, um, which is this right here. Right. And one of the most famous scenes um, from the Book of the Dead, um, which is a compilation of funerary spells um, buried with the deceased to guide them through the afterlife, um, is the weighing of the heart ceremony in which the heart of the deceased, which is believed to be the seat of all knowledge, which recorded the good and the bad deeds of a person's life, was weighed against the ma'at feather, so the feather of truth, on the scales of ma'at. And if the heart was found to be lighter or equal in weight to the feather, the deceased had led a virtuous life and will go, go on to the field of reeds. Um, so paradise. Um, right. But if the heart was heavier than the feather, it was deemed unworthy and it was devoured by the demoness Amit. Um, and so the deceased would undergo a second death, which essentially condemned them to remain in the underworld for eternity and never achieve the afterlife. Um, so just this one fragment alone explains so much um, right. about ancient Egyptian ideology. Um, and it's amazing to see that, you know, it was still revered um, when the Greeks came in and they occupied Egypt. And um, it was still one of the primary concepts of um, Egyptian ideology. Amazing. Amazing. And uh, another image um, normally found in either the legs um, or the feet is... This right here, let me see if I can flip it around. So this is known um, as uh, the Keker frieze. Okay. Um, and so it's a de decorative border um, consisting of upright motifs that would resemble um, Egyptologists like to think either papyrus or reed stalks um, that were bundled together um, or it might represent um, the fringes of a carpet hanging on the walls of houses, um, which okay. is normal in ancient Egypt. Right. Um, and it is one of the most famous and old, oldest friezes in ancient Egyptian art, as it first appeared in the early dynastic period, which was 3000 BCE. Okay. Um, and it was originally only used in the wall decor of royal tombs, um, but it was later adopted into elite and private art models on a variety of mediums. And in Egyptian, keker is the word for ornament. Okay. Um, and it appears as a hieroglyph in and of itself, um, either as an ideogram or determinative for the word um, to be adorned or adornment. Mm -hmm. So the hieroglyph itself explains its functional purpose in art as um, a primary use of ornamentation. Um, and so it would always be found um, either as a border along the bottom of the feet or along um, the top um, the top border of the leg panel. Okay. Um, but it is, it's found basically everywhere on, um, on Egyptian art. So there's a lot of stuff that goes back to the origins um, of Egyptian iconography. Um, which is one of the things that I find most fascinating about um, the, the classic department papyri. And Do you have one more thing? One, one last thing, right? Yeah. No. 
So this is the last, I mean, there's hundreds of uh, iconographic features in the collection, um, but I tried to narrow it down to the most uh, important ones. Okay. So this one is another favorite just by the, uh, I'm not sure why it's. Is there a focus? I think you could probably try to focus it in. Now the vagaries of our technology. I know. <laughs> okay. There you there go. You go. Um, just the, the pigment on this alone is wow. remarkable. Yeah. The red is a beautiful red. Um, but so this, uh, this fragment, so it normally will cover the legs um, and they are mummy form uh, figures. So figures that are um, in the pose of being mummified. Mm -hmm. And they likely represent um, the four sons of the god Horus. Um, so because you can see that there are still two figures above, it's just that the papyrus has been cut. Right. Um, but so it is a total of four figures altogether. Um, and they were protective funerary deities, um, mm -hmm. sometimes referred to as genie, since they're only found in mortuary contexts and they right. have no cults. Um, but they were characteristically shown mummified originally with human heads. And then when you go into the new kingdom, each deity g gained um, a distinctive head. Right. So you can see this one is a human head. Mm -hmm. And this was um, the son Imseti. And then this is a jackal headed um, uh, figure. And this was the son Duamtef. Mm -hmm. And so the four sons um, were also primarily associated with canopic jars, um, which were jars um, where the organs of the deceased were placed in. Mm -hmm. um, and their head, the deities' heads would have functioned as the lids because they were regarded as the guardians or reincar reincarnations of specific organs right. um, removed during the mummification process. So um, Imseti, the human headed figure, was associated with the liver. Mm -hmm. um, and then Duamutef was uh, associated with the stomach. Um, and then the other two uh, sons, um, one was known as Happy, who was apeded and was associated with the lungs. And then the last one was um, falcon headed, and his name was. I always have a problem pronouncing it. Um, Kehev Senuef um, okay. was associated with the intestines. Um, but so the Egyptians, um, in terms of mortuary practice, they believed um, that they needed to preserve their most vital organs so that they can continue to live in the um, afterlife. Um, so that's why they were placed in these jars called canopic jars, because it was meant to preserve the organs um, right. so that the Egyptians could take it with them into their next life. But the most, the funniest thing that I find about that is that they actually discarded the brain. Oh. Um, so that was one organ that was not um, preserved because they believed that the heart was the seat of all knowledge. So the mm -hmm. heart functioned as what we know the heart to function as but also function as the brain um, so that's an uh something that i really love about um egyptian ideology and their notions of the heart being the seat of all knowledge it's amazing but yeah so I mean, that is what i have what an amazing show and tell that was <laughs> the cartoon edge. maybe we could just kind of wrap up then maybe we could just come back on camera um yes. maybe talk a little bit about um this collection as a whole um, you know, explain kind of the research value of it and also the research that probably still needs to be done um, using these materials. Yeah. So that is a big, uh, big thing to comment on. Um, so the iconography, um, it's really important because it teaches you so much about Egyptian ideology um, in general and mm -hmm. how um, pharaonic ideology, so you know, the native um, Egyptians, their ideologies were still used by um, the Greek uh, conquerors, so the Ptolemies um, that came to Egypt, but they still preferred the traditional Egyptian concepts. Um, right. And that's why you can find so much of traditional Egyptian iconography in these Ptolemaic cartoonage pieces right. um, because of that reverence for um, just the antiquity of 
Egyptian culture at the time because the Ptolemies, you know, this is 305 uh, BCE and Egyptian civilization, you know, really formed in 3000 BC. So it's almost a 3000 period. Right. Um, so it's amazing to see this still the reference of original tradition um, and ideologies. And so the iconography is important for art. It's important for understanding um, ancient Egyptian society and cartoonage in itself. It's important to understand the production process, um, how it would have kind of the monopoly of it, you know, where where it was produced, um, how it was produced, because you see that there are some variances between just using um, a whole bunch of papyrus or using papyrus and linen mm -hmm. um, and then making use of reuse um, administrative text. Um, and then the the Victoria College um, papyri collection, the text, because they are not as fragmented as um, the, the classics department collection, they teach us a lot about um, the socioeconomic matters of Greco-Roman Egypt. Um, because it's not just, um, you know, marriage contracts and wills and administrative matters, there are personal letters. Right. Um, and some of the personal letters attest to um, the multicultural nature of um, Greco-Roman Egypt, because it wasn't just uh, Greeks and Romans, you know, there was um, a lot of interaction with the Levant and, and even Anatolia, which is Turkey. Um, right. And so you get um, examples of personal letters where someone is asking for um, a flute to be brought in from Phrygia, which is in Turkey. Um, and Turkey is not by, by no means a close distance to Egypt. Right. Um, so to ask for something so far away, it, it also attests to the um, elite culture that would have been in um, Greco-Roman Egypt. Um, so this collection, it covers a whole bunch of things. It covers um, materiality of the book, it covers Egyptian art, it covers Egyptian society, politics, the economy, um, and it also attests to classical literature. Right. So there's so much that can be learned um, by this. And one of the things that I would like to do because of my personal background is kind of provide um, a very detailed description of the iconography. Right. Um, because the catalog description that we presently have um, kind of focuses more on the textual stuff. Right. Um, so the only aspects of iconography that are acknowledged is just like the pigments, so the colors that were used, right. um, but the motifs and the symbols themselves, it's not talked about whatsoever. Um, so that's something that I bring in and I want to make more aware and I'd really like um, for other departments of the University of Toronto and even other educational institutions in Canada and across the world um, to realize the importance of this collection because it has so much to offer and so much value. Um, and there's, I didn't mention this, but it's over 400 fragments. So it's by no means a small collection. Right. Um, it's huge. And I really struggled to choose what to show because there's just so much I could talk about. There's so much available and there's so much art and text um, and and materiality that can be talked about. Well, it's amazing that we're able to have a collection here at Fisher that maps so nicely to your own personal interests and to your research yeah. interests. So um, unfortunately, probably, you know, you know, you, you have to work on so many other things. You can't devote yourself exclusively to this. But yeah. I think as long as you can bring more, of, um, you know, explain more of, of what is the collection. And I think some, some of it is online, isn't it? Some of it has been digitized. Yes, so um, most of the Victoria College papyrus has been digitized, um, except for the, the literary fragments. I'm not sure why the classical literature hasn't been digitized. Right. Um, and almost all of the classics department um, papyrus has been digitized, um, but they're in two separate um, uh, sections. Right. Um, the Victoria College uh, papyrus is um, in a website called Papyri Info, yep. whereas um, the Classics Department of Papyrus is through the the Fisher website. All right. Well, we'll we'll, we'll post both of those uh, both those links in the uh, on, on the video itself. So again, Shauna, thank you for this. This has been really wonderful. Thank um, you. It's it's great to look at some of the material. That's some of our oldest material here at the library as well, because um, it's not an, it's it's uh, it's it's so special and treasured that material. Um, so again, thank you. Um,
we'll be back in two weeks time. Um, we're going to go centuries into the future from what we've been looking at today. Um, we're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to be honoring the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. Um, and we're going to be looking at materials related, our banting and best material, um, our archival materials. So please join us in two weeks time for that. So again, enjoy your weekend. Thanks again, Shauna. And we will see everybody in two weeks time. Thank you. Bye.